Hello and welcome to this episode of Top 5 Unexplained. We will look at places where you are more than likely to witness a UFO or a UAP as they're called today. There are so many UFO hotspots around the world where UFOs continue to be seen regularly. And some of these places have a long history of UFO sightings. Now, I always say for everyone to keep their eyes on the skies, at, usually at the very end of the show. And in in this case in particular, visitors to the mentioned UFO hotspots should definitely take their cameras and watch the skies. Before we get started, I would like to say that this channel is so close, so close to 30,000 subscribers, which is a major milestone. I often get told that the algorithm doesn't look favorably on uh, the, the kinds of topics that we cover on this channel, and I, I definitely believe it after talking to other content creators. I have over 500 videos on this channel now, and I love making this content for you. And there are channels that have less than 200 videos and make about like maybe one video a week. And they have such higher subscriber stats because their video topics are about non-fringe subjects. Okay. I do three shows a week. Just imagine that. So with all that being said, I would like to ask you, you amazing viewers and listeners as well, to please share these videos with others. Make sure to leave comments, hit the like button. Let's get to 30,000 together. I'm so excited. But today it's the top five UFO hotspots. And we're going to be looking at different locations from around the world. So I'm going to share my screen here as a visual aid and let's just get straight into it. Okay, this, this image right here is definitely a grabber. Uh, I When I saw this, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, we need to cover this. And this right here, we're going to be discussing the Kakala in Thailand. And this is a mountain located in the southern province of Nikhon Si Thamarat, Thailand. And the area is known for its beautiful natural scenery and historical significance, which, which we are going to get into, as well as the many UFO sightings that have been reported right there in that area. The mountain itself is home to several important Buddhist temples and is a popular destination for pilgrims and tourists alike. And I'll share another image here of that. Look at that, stunning. It's also believed to be the site of an ancient city as well. But in recent years, this location, Kaukala, has become known for the high number of UFO sightings that have been reported in the area. And many locals and tourists have reported seeing strange, unexplained lights and objects in the sky, including disc-shaped craft, bright orbs, and even humanoid figures. So just imagine, okay? Let's let, let's get into the mentality of the majority of people that would visit this mountain. They're there as pilgrims, right? They're they're there to um, worship certain Buddhist temples there with that kind of mentality. So could you imagine you're you're praying, you're reciting mantras, and then you look up into the sky and you see like these fast moving objects in the sky. You're seeing orbs. What would go through your mind? Would you think? Is that a sign? Is is that an omen right there? Or is that a UFO? Or is it just military tech? I, I think that whenever we go somewhere, uh, either as tourists or going on, you know, a, even like a, a local type of vacation, you definitely bring a mindset with you when you visit anywhere. You could even visit to a restaurant and you already have the expectations and you're already in this mentality of what you're going to eat, kind of the idea of how it's going to taste. You you already have this path set for you mentally. The same thing can go for a place like this. So I just, I, I think it would be wild to go with the one mindset and you look up into the sky and you see something totally wild. Well, there have been so many UFO sightings in this area that there was a UFO Calcutta Research Center that was created just nearby back in 2010. That goes to show you right there that one, they, this UFO Research Center is named after this mountain. And two, there have been so many sightings that people even thought of the idea to create a research center. And this is back in 2010. 
2010, 13 years ago. And they have come across some very interesting information and data as well. But the, the group used a variety of equipment to study the area as you should. Don't just use your eyeballs, but you do want to use some equipment, including cameras, video recorders, and electromagnetic field detectors. They reported that the area had a high level of electromagnetic activity, which they believe may be related to the reported sightings. And here is one member of that group. If it wants me to pull it up, there we go. And this is a very interesting looking alien because usually we don't see lips. This one has some very tiny, tiny plump lips right there. So back when this group was created in 2010, they not only had some of the sightings of, of their own, but they were doing a lot of interviews, talking to a lot of people that were frequent pilgrims to this, to this area. Because in this part of Thailand, there are multiple Buddhist temples there. It's classified as sacred. It's classified as when you go there, you need to be respectful and pay respects, right? So I, I think it's it's a it's a two in one whammy right there. If you're a Buddhist or or if you just want to see the beautiful architecture, that's great. You're going there for that, and then bam, you get to see UFOs too. Fully for it. Like I would go in a heartbeat. Yes. <laughs> Cassidy, thank you so much for the super sticker and supporting the channel. And thank you for everyone that's watching this live. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, jump over to YouTube. That link is below or just type in Christina Gomez to watch all of the shows and see all of the visuals that we share right here on YouTube. Now, one of the most significant pieces of data that the group collected was a series of photographs taken back in September of 2010. So like right after the group was created. Could you can you believe that I've spoken to a good amount of UFO researchers, many of those that are a part of UFO organizations and for a group to just be created and then to see stuff right after is incredible. Well, these photographs show a bright spherical object in the sky, which appeared to be emitting a bright light. And the object was described as being roughly the size of a car and was seen hovering in the sky for several minutes before suddenly disappearing. I, I, I like those little details because, yeah, you can see anything in the sky and you're like, OK, airplane, helicopter, drone, maybe even a satellite. Right. But when you see something and then it disappears the next moment, you're like, OK, there might just maybe there might be something a little more to that. That's not always the case. Of course, there are mundane objects that can go behind a cloud and then it looks like it disappears. But 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 hear me out. It allows your mind to muse about these things. It allows your imagination to run because when we become adults and it's not easy being an adult. And I know that many of you can agree to that. We lose touch with our imagination. What, what What's most important to us is paying the bills. And yes, very, very true. But we sometimes lose touch with that childlike curiosity, that childlike mindset just allowing your mind to run to daydream. These things are so important for our well-being and for our creativity as well. So, you know, if if you think it's a, an, an alien or not, a UFO or not, just kind of going on that stream of thought, that line of thought, it's very interesting. It's also very fun. And it gets you interested in these topics once again, like you probably were when you were a child. And that right there, gives this fuel inside of you, this passion to continue doing the research when sometimes it feels like you're just meeting so many dead ends, so many brick walls, but you continue because you have that interest in it. The group has also reported that they had interviewed several eyewitnesses who had seen familiar objects in the sky in the past. Many of these witnesses describe seeing bright lights or objects moving at high speeds through the sky, and some even reported seeing humanoid figures or beings associated with the objects. And we're going to, I have a story for you on that, but that is wild. That is so crazy. And there could be people that would see something like that 
and they would say, okay, maybe it's it's Buddha himself or it's a, a diff not the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, but could be a, a different type, right? Um, which would be really interesting. Then came that whole conversation of interdimensionals as well in the conversation with extraterrestrials, right? It's, it's a never ending conversation. There are so many twists and turns, so many different rabbit holes. It's very difficult to wrap your mind over all of them, but it's nice that we're able to touch on these things at least today. Well, even the government got involved with this. Yes, yes, they did. So it was found that the Thai Ministry of Defense did release a report on UFO sightings in the country, Ooh, which is very, very cool. But also during these gatherings that took place back in 2019, the because there were so many people that were interested in this mountain, not only to worship the temples and the entities in the temples, but also to research UFOs, extraterrestrials, and have these kinds of conversations, it was getting so packed up there that the government had to get involved to break up the groups. Crazy. Well, back in 2019, the Thai Ministry of Defense released a report very specifically on November 25th, which detailed several cases of UFO sightings by Thai military pilots. You know, we always talk about the United States, about how we got our report and how great that was. But that was what, 2021? And that was our first one. Thai, Thailand is way ahead of us. And they released their first one back in 2019, looking at UFO sightings that were seen by military pilots. They're ahead of the game. And yet no one talked about it in the years that I have been doing UFO research. This is the first time, and that's so depressing to say, this is the first time I've heard about this report released by Thailand. But let me know in the comments, let me know in the live chat, did you hear about this? Because I yeah, I was in the dark here. And we're going to be covering a few other countries that uh, did the same thing before we did. So based on the news articles and reports collected, it appeared that the Thai Ministry of Defense did release a report on UFO sightings in the country, and the report was said to have been compiled by the Royal Thai Air Force and was presented to the Deputy Prime Minister and Defense Minister. The report allegedly contained information on 10 UFO sightings that were reported between 2002 to 2019. And some of the key findings and insights from the report include that the UFO sightings were reported by both military and civilian witnesses, and some of the sightings were even captured on video. The report did not provide any conclusive evidence that the UFOs were of extraterrestrial origin, but it did note that some of the sightings could not be explained by conventional means, which is saying something without saying something. And the report recommended that the Thai government establish a committee to investigate UFO sightings and develop a protocol for dealing with them. See, I like, I like where they're going with this. So overall, the report seems to suggest that there have been some unexplained UFO sightings all throughout Thailand and that further investigation is needed to determine their origin and significance. I, I love this. I, I love the amount of countries that have a fascination with these types of conversations. Not only are so many different countries creating and have created UFO offices, but there's also so many countries that have their own nonprofit UFO groups created by civilians, um, which we're also going to touch on. And, and I absolutely love that. Paul, thank you so much. Love your live streams, Christina. Hello to everyone. Hello, Paul. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, let's get into an experience that someone had. And this is kind of how this location became famous for its UFO sightings and the connection with meditation and to have an experience. Kind of before CE5 was a big thing, because this took place back in 1997 when a retired sergeant major... Charid, and I'm not even going to say his last name because uh, it's, in, it's in Thai and it's just like a bunch of letters all together. But he was in deep 
Buddhist meditation, that's what he said, at, at his home, which was very next to this temple, when he received mental messages, what he insisted were aliens. And he told his family this. He's like, guys, I just was in communication with E.T. This is unbelievable. I was here to quiet the mind, to be mindful, focus on the breath. And then, bam, I got telepathic communication. The family heard this and they're like, dude, you're out of your mind. That Are you okay? So as he's telling the whole family this, everyone's looking at him like he's wild. And his daughter says, Oh, yeah? You had an experience? Well, you know what? Tell the aliens to show themselves. And so then the very next day, the allegedly, the aliens send energy to spin her brother and her brother-in-law. Okay, now it's getting wild. I have not heard a story like that one in the years of doing research, looking at UFO experiences for someone to say, oh, yeah? Yeah, show them. Let, let's see what happens. And then they get spun around. Mm. I don't know if that's like a good thing, a bad thing, a scary thing, a happy thing. I guess it just depends on the person that's perceiving this event. But looking at it from an outsider, I'm like, first of all, why would they even listen? Right. Second of all, out of all the things that they could do, why would they spin you around? They might like throw up in your chair. Like, well, you know, when you're on those spinny chairs in the office and you just spin around in circles after a few little twirls. Not only does your head spin, but your stomach spins with you on that one. And so after this situation, back in 1997, the the family believed him. They're like, okay, now we most many of us had experiences. No, we we, to we totally get you. This went into the public eye. The um, experiencer, the retired, the 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 retired sergeant major was telling this out he said that it was right next to to calcutta and then that's when all this interest came up about this mountain being a ufo hotspot but there were sightings before then before 1997 but it was because of him that it got really really famous and what i like about this story is that from what I've read, what I've looked into, I'm looking at this image as well. This is a great example. This is people from the UFO group that is in deep meditation right on top of the mountain to have communication with ET very much like CE5. But this has been going on for thousands of years. This is nothing new. This is nothing, nothing new. Um, Indians have done this back in India. They have been doing this in Asia. Um, it's it's uh, it's fascinating um, but it didn't reach the West really until Stephen Greer. But, he, and I've had this conversation before, and I would like to hear your thoughts on this. What do you think about sitting in meditation and attempting to have communication with an entity that you know nothing about? You don't know if it has good or negative intentions. And, and even if they were to respond to you, why? For what purpose? You know, you're, you're one out of eight billion people, right? Uh, and, and one planet out of trillions of planets. That's my question. But for those that have had those experiences, I think that's great. If, 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 if that's what you wanted, awesome. Um, but I would like to kind of get an understanding of like, what's going through this entity's mind? Is it is it actually extraterrestrial? Is it demonic that people can kind of have that correlation mentally as well like what's going on there and in buddhism and hinduism and even taoism often meditation is for connecting to higher beings and other realms but also celestials immortals and entities uh from the skies um sadhus still still do it babas yogis this practice has been going on for thousands of years it's still happening today for these reasons and so many more and for those that don't know, Stephen Greer went to India. That's how we got this. Th that's how he learned about the CE5 methods. He learned it from India. And then he brought it here from a, from a, a Baba guru. And it's just something that I think it's very cool to look from the outside. But it hasn't been something that I've tried. 
at least not yet. But I would like to hear your thoughts, hear your opinions on this as well. Have you tried it? Would you like to try it? If you don't, why are you hesitant? Uh, I love hearing your thoughts on these types of things. And while you share that, I will move on over to our next location, which is also a different country as well. I'm going to pull up this image because this, this image right here is beautiful. All right, let's pull this up. Oh, and by the way, I'm saving the best for last. The most famous for last. This one is San Clemente in Chile. And this is a small town about 200 kilometers south of the capital, Santiago. And the area is known for its just beautiful natural scenery and very rich cultural history. But... Of course, there's been a lot of reported UFO sightings in the area. So the first recorded UFO sighting was back in 2001, when a group of local residents reported seeing a bright triangular object in the sky. And since then, there have been many reported sightings in the area, including sightings of bright lights, orbs, and other unexplained phenomena. But one of the more famous sightings actually occurred in 2002, a year later, when a group of local police officers reported seeing a large disc-shaped object hovering in the sky right over the small town. This is a very small town, by the way. The officers reported that the object was silent and that it appeared to be em emitting a pulsing light. The sightings were then investigated by the Chilean government's Committee for the Study of Anomalous Aerial Phenomena. This is back in 2002, guys. Chile was way ahead of the game, at least publicly, saying that they already had a UFO task force. I'm going to say that instead of that really long name that they provided themselves. But they concluded that the officers had witnessed an anomalous aerial phenomenon that could not be explained by conventional means. That's amazing. They're like, yeah, we don't know. It must be a UFO. Instead of like really trying to brush it off and, and give it a very conventional explanation. This is back in 2002 and they're like, yeah, we, you know, we looked into it. We spoke to you guys, wrote all the notes down and uh, we don't know what it is. So it must, it must be something anomalous, something kind of weird. And remember, this is funded by, by Chile's taxes, by the civilians of Chile. Their taxes are paying for this. And I would much rather get that answer here in the United States than stating, nah, it's it's a drone. Actually, you know what? No, it's it's Venus. That that's what it is. They're spending their tax dollars right back there in Chile. Now, this organiz this uh, government committee was created back in 1997 under the jurisdiction of the general uh, of of civilian aeronautics and the Chilean government agency is is in charge of regulating and supervising the country's civil aviation industry. Its main objective is to analyze and investigate cases of unidentified aerial phenomena reported by pilots, air traffic controllers, and other credible witnesses. We need to talk more about Chile, guys. Just we, we need to because that is amazing. This is back in 1997. And they're looking very specifically at UFOs from credible witnesses. And they're not making it someone else's problem like Kirkpatrick from Arrow. They're taking the bull by the horns. Now, is this information public, what they're finding? To my understanding, bits and pieces are, but a lot of it is not. That's the downfall there. But still, that information right there is public and that makes me decently happy. And the team is operated by multiple experts, including air traffic controllers, meteorologists, and aviation safety specialists who use scientific methods and techniques to investigate UFO sightings. Also awesome. Their investigations involve analyzing radar and satellite data, conducting interviews with witnesses, and carrying out physical and chemical analysis of any physical evidence, such as debris or traces left by the phenomenon. Great. Amazing. Amazing. Well, going back to San Clemente in Chile, 
In 2012, there was a major UFO conference there, which was attended by researchers, investigators, and enthusiasts from around the world. The conference featured presentations on the latest UFO research and evidence, as well as discussions and debates on the nature of the phenomenon and its possible origins. There are multiple UFO groups there as well, but there was one person in particular, the president of the Chilean grouping for ufo research rodrigo said that from 1995 to 1996 one year in in that area in san, in san clemente he said that there was at least one ufo sighting a week that's 52 sightings in a year and those are only the ones that have been reported during that time frame that's pretty good something consistent like that is decently rare of course, there are a few locations that we're going to be covering here today where there are consistent UFO sightings, but to get one at least once a week for a good year is, is uh, very, very impressive. It's very cool. Okay, let me take a look at this. Okay. Um... There were a few other things that I did want to mention about that before we move on. We have so many places to cover, such little time to do it in. But back in 2008, there was a specific group. It's called the Grupo UFO San Clemente, um, who was they're They're looking into this location very, very specifically because the other group I had mentioned, it's like for Chile as a whole. But this one is just in that small little place created in 2008. And they have collected a lot of UFO sightings from witnesses, have done interviews, and they even have a few UFO watch parties as well. That's very fun. I, I feel like that's a great way to do crowdfunding. Very smart. It's just to have a watch party and bring some snacks, some chips and salsa, some drinks. Sounds great. Moving on to our next location. This one is Wycliffe West in Australia. And this, the images here are very, very cool. And I have a lot to say about this location right here. Because Wycliffe Well, I said West, I meant to say Well, is a small settlement located in the Northern Territory of Australia, about halfway between Alice Springs and Tennant Creek. The area is known for its high number of reported UFO sightings, earning its nickname of Australia's UFO capital. That's how big it is. Because keep in mind, Australia is a ginormous country. It's huge. And for there to only be one UFO capital, Australia's UFO capital, that's saying something right there. And the first recorded sighting took place in 1950. Of course, there were a few prior. It was kind of like the, the, the first big one. And for all of my Australians out there, say hey. Say, what's, what's up? <laughs> Tyler is one of them. Say, what? Yeah. Yeah. Australia is on my top five list of UFO hotspots. And this location right here, if you ever go to Australia, you're going to have to visit this place. So let's continue onward. Because the first sighting was supposedly back in, 19, in 1950, but there have been a lot of sightings since then. And witnesses have reported seeing bright lights in the sky, unusual aircraft, and even alien creatures. But UFO sightings have been part of the Wycliffe Wells folklore since World War II. And the town's reputation for the unexplained attracts all types. Even the Royal Australian Air Force has stopped to investigate. You know it's good. You know it's so good when the military is like, hey, did you hear that story about that UFO sighting over there? Let's go check it out. But let's get some funding for it first to like go on vacation in a sense and uh, do some and like research and do collect some data from this place. Should we do that? That is a great idea, Greg. Let's go. Amazing. Right. Um, but it, but I, I do love the whole boots on the ground here with the the. the um, the Australian Air Force is getting involved, but also it's a huge attraction for tourists from all around the world. Spaced Out Radio. Hey, Dave. 
Thank you so much for that. That you're so sweet. Um, I know that you are also so busy doing so many shows a week. Guys, go check out his channel. He, he has awesome content. Thanks, Dave. So one of the biggest attractions of Wycliffe is obviously the UFO sightings. But for those that want to have good a good experience while having UFO sightings, there's Holiday Park. Yes, Wycliffe Well Holiday Park welcomes all travelers. And the park's owner tells that many claim to have seen UFOs zipping around the night sky. And he also states that the park's bar has the biggest range of beer available in Australia. Now, that is nothing to do with this at all, but it's somewhat related to this location right here. Okay, now let's get into the details on this because... It was created by Lou Farkas back in the 80s, and he spent about $4 million to create this attraction. And there's a, there's a handful of images. The, the whole park, it's filled with art uh, and, and little statues and stuff. And, I mean, look at this. But it was created back in the 80s, and it's just been a wild attraction. Hey, Jay, Marty. All the way watching this on Twitch. Thanks. <laughs> I do also have a Twitch account for those that didn't know. And you can watch these shows right there as well. But looking at uh, these images. Stunning. Here is Lou Farkas. And he ended up selling the place. And we're, we're going to get into that. But he spent $4 million to create this attraction back in the 80s. That was some real dough back then. And that's a lot of money right here, right now. But sometimes... He had mentioned, because he, he did a, an, an in-depth interview, he stated that during the time that he had it, sometimes the UFO thing was good for business, and sometimes it was pretty bad. On, on a lot of occasions, people were getting chased down the highway by these lights, so much so that when they saw a little location like this one, they pull in in a panic, and they say, quick, give us a room. We simply cannot be on the road anymore. We're being chased by UFOs. Try telling that to your family right after vacation. I, I would love to see their face when you tell someone that. And Lou had mentioned that he was getting this, this statement consistently throughout the decades that they were being chased down the highway by these bright lights. Either you love it or you hate it. Either you're going to go arms stretched out and ready to hug these balls of light, or you're going to be sprinting as fast as you can to a safe location. But the question is, are you really safe? Mm. So he, he had stated that, you know, in, in these instances, it was pretty good for business as it chased some people <laughs> down down the highway into his little and his little park, his little attraction, hotel slash bar slash restaurant slash little town, really. And other times, people just didn't want to stop. They're like, no, this is too scary for us. But in, in all of this, in, in all of this, he had stated that in the times that he was there, he received hundreds upon hundreds of stories from witnesses that wanted to get... The, get their experiences off their chest so much so and this was so smart of him he put a diary on the counter and he says you have a story write it down the sad thing this, this is so sad though when he sold the place he didn't take the diary and he didn't publish it i am so mad at him for doing that because he he's he tells in the interview oh yeah i collected hundreds upon hundreds of stories but I didn't keep them. All I have now is memories. Thank you for that. Thank you for leaving me, leaving me hanging, really. But aside from that, it's incredible that so many people confide in him and his workers to tell their stories. Also, I um, did interview an Aussie researcher from KUNX, who said to have to to um, who said that car chasing UFOs seems very very common in Australia. That was researcher Ben Hurl. We him and I we went into detail on that not just not just about UFOs but also the Yowie 
as well. So do catch that interview right here on this channel. It is fascinating. It's it's wild because not only was he being ch not from the stories that he collected, they were being the witnesses were being chased by UFOs. And the question would be, what are they going to do with the car? Why are they chasing down UFOs? Is it for carjacking of some kind? I mean, even there's a few en encounters where Bigfoot, Yowie, was chasing down cars in Australia. Australia is a scary place. It's dangerous when it comes to the unexplained. But I would go there in a heartbeat if given the opportunity as well. Here are a few. Let's kind of go back to this image. For people that visit this attraction now, from what I've read, it looks very abandoned. It looks like an abandoned amusement park in a sense. It hasn't been getting as much traction as it did in the 80s. I think that'll probably pick back up now that UFOs are being so popular right now. I mean, if you go to the store, you can literally go to any clothing store and there's going to be some kind of alien merch there. And I'm just going to assume I, and here in the States, that's definitely a thing. And I'm just going to assume I feel like a, a good handful of other parts of the world as well, because it's trending right now. And so I would I would like to hope that this location is also trending and being awesome as well. And even like the the alien gray face, that's a meme, like on hats and on T-shirts and stuff. It's definitely a, a meme there. But there have been a few reports, like in 1998, a group of locals reported seeing a series of strange bright lights in the sky, and the lights were described as being white or yellow and moving in a circular pattern. They appeared to be hovering slightly in the sky for several minutes before suddenly disappearing, like the one in Thailand. And then in 2001, a truck driver reported seeing a large disc-shaped object in the sky, and the object was described as being silver or gray and moving quickly through the air and the driver reported that the object showed him for several followed him for several miles before suddenly disappearing so here's another story of that where a ufo is chasing down a car and the question is why for what it's so random in my opinion but there must be an explanation maybe they're trying to like chase off the people because that's like their territory maybe or we could even go into the idea that it could be just sort of a black project and it's scaring people away from a certain location for some for some unknown reason. Could be. We don't know. We have no answers whatsoever. All we can do is guess, guesstimate, muse, use our imagination as well. But from the years I've been doing the research, nobody has the answers. And that's including myself don't know, but I love doing this type of research. And then in 2006, a tourist reported seeing a strange object in the sky that appeared to be emitting a light, like a white light. And the object was described as being circular in shape and hovering silently in the sky for several minutes before suddenly disappearing. And then in 2011, a group of campers reported seeing a series of bright flashing lights in the sky. The lights were described as being white or blue and moving quickly through the air. The campers reported that the light appeared to be following a specific pattern before suddenly disappearing. That's a very interesting detail and not one that I hear too often, but stating that it followed a specific pattern. Why? For what? Maybe they had to like do a certain pattern in order to open a portal. Like when you play those video games or you have those types of codes on your phone, that's like a box of what, nine dots and you got to do a certain pattern to open your phone. Could you imagine if that was the way to open a portal? That'd be like a fun game or an incredibly dangerous depending on the situation. Could that have been the case back in 2011 that were seen by these campers? I don't know, but <laughs> something worth musing about for sure. And then in 2019, a family reported seeing a large bright object in the sky that appeared to be hovering silently over the horizon. And the object was described as being circular or oval in shape and emitting a bright white light. Consistent theme here. The family reported that the object disappeared suddenly after several minutes. So we're seeing a lot of bright lights and a lot of very quick disappearing here in this in this location in Australia. Are they all like the same? Are they all different? Don't know, but I think it is fascinating. 
looking at these types of cases. So I hope that you're taking notes. And if you live in any of these locations or would like to visit any of these locations, check them out, take some pictures, write it down, share it with me. I'd love to hear all of it. AJ Raffle, thank you. Aliens looked at Earth and concluded cars were the dominant species? Question <laughs> mark. That's a funny one. <laughs> See, I'm thinking more has to do with carjacking. Like, maybe they really want the car or they need the parts. <laughs> maybe. But for them, for cars to be a dominant species, I don't know. But that's a funny one. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> so I went ahead and I looked up if there were any military bases nearby. And it's something that we do need to consider because with a lot of UFO sightings, they happen in and around military bases. This is around the world. Okay, this is information that you can find anywhere. So there aren't any in the exact vicinity of Wycliffe Well, but there is one about 62 miles southeast. And this is the Royal Australian Air Force base called Tyndall. And there are a few others in nearby locations, but I went ahead and I looked that up for all of them, all of these places. And consistently with all the locations that we've covered and that we will cover, there's, an, there's a base anywhere from 60 to about 100 miles away. Is that significant? Is information worth providing? But, you know, you can make your own conclusions on that awesome let's move on now this one when you think of a ufo hotspot you would you're definitely going to think of this very specific location i'm going to share an image here because uh, this place is beautiful from the images that i've seen i'm like uh, stunning and i'm going to see if you can guess the place if you're watching this on youtube all right here is that image can you guess where this is this is Sedona, Arizona. It is known. It is known as a UFO hotspot. We've covered it a few times here on this channel. We even did the Mysteries of Arizona on Mysteries with a History with Jimmy Church. We went into detail on this. There are a handful of UFO researchers that have looked in depth into this location, has conduct have conducted research, and have collected data as well. But... It's such a beautiful, beautiful place. And you might ask yourself, like, what's so good about Sedona? For those that can't see the image, right? Well, one of the biggest attractions is that it has these incredible red rock formations. Sedona's landscape is dominated by red sandstone formations that are millions of years old. And the unique color and shape of these formations makes Sedona a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts and photographers. But then you can look at this from a different perspective. If you're not there to see the geology or if you are... Um, if, if, excuse me, if you're not there for the geology and photography, there's a, a big new age group there as well. But because of the amount of UFO sightings that have been seen in the area, there are several UFO researchers that live there now. There's dark skies at night. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the law there. They can't have any light pollution. So the street lights go off at 8 p.m. for people to see in the sky better because the whole location, all of Sedona is stating, we want to keep, we want to stay away from light pollution. We want people to see the stars and to see UFOs as well. That's a really big deal. That's something that's really important to mention. But there's also this connection, this idea of vortexes. And Sedona is said to have several vortex sites where the energy is believed to be particularly powerful and conducive to healing, meditation, and spiritual experiences. Many visitors come to Sedona specifically to experience these vortexes and explore their spiritual side. And then you have people that think that these vortexes have a connection with all of these UFO sightings. It's so significant in this area that not only are lights supposed to be out by 8 p.m., but there are a handful, a handful of UFO tours as well that, that, 
drive to multiple locations and attempt to look for UFOs. While it's not guaranteed that you're going to see one every time you go on these tours, there's a pretty high percentage rate from what I came across that people do see something in the sky. Now, are they being fooled that what they see is as a satellite to be a UFO? It's possible, but they do in these tours, they do use night vision. They do, they are provided equipment. And in some tours, they share historical information about UFO sightings and the area in general as well. So I think that if if you believe these tours or not, if you're going to go to Sedona, it might be worthwhile just to kind of have that experience to hear information from these knowledgeable tour guides and to hopefully see a UFO. I mean, that would be amazing. When, I mean, that would be the highlight of any vacation. I think so. But there have been a few pretty famous or popular UFO sightings that have taken place there. One of them took place back in 1953 when a group of military officers and scientists claimed to have witnessed a UFO hovering in the sky. And according to the reports, the objects were disc-shaped and appeared to be scanning the area with a beam of light. And then in 1987, a local pilot reported seeing a strange glowing object in the sky, and the object was described as being orange in color and moving in a zigzag pattern before disappearing from view. Then in 1995, a group of tourists visiting Sedona reported seeing a formation of brightly lit objects flying in the sky over the town, and the objects were described as moving in a synchronized pattern before suddenly disappearing from view. Then, in 2017, a video emerged online purporting to show a UFO flying over this location. The video, which was taken by a local resident, showed a bright glowing object moving through the sky at a very high rate of speed. Many locals and visitors to Sedona report seeing unexplained lights and objects in the sky on a regular basis. Some believe that the area's unique energy and magnetic fields may be attracting UFOs or other extraterrestrial phenomena. That is something to mention from what I've come across and even doing this show, the mysteries of Arizona due to the iron in the rocks. That's why we get this beautiful red color. It has to do with the, it creates this type of magnetic field from what researchers believe. And could that, could that attract more UFO sightings? It could be. I, I mean, from, Researchers from around the world, places that have higher magnetic fields or electromagnetic activity that's more significant, there are more UFO sightings. This image right here is of Antelope Canyon, another beautiful place. Um, I think that's like right next to Sedona, but I, to me, it looks like a freaking labyrinth. I, and, and this was made naturally. This, this image blows my mind every single time. I just wanted to share that with you. I'm just going to leave it up a little bit. But um, there is a place in Sedona called Thunder Mountain. The question would be, why is it called that? Well, because it's like a lightning rod. Then the question would be, where does that energy go? Is it being harnessed by something or someone? Don't know. But I came across a little bit more information before we move on. And based on the analysis of the descriptions of the UFO sightings in Sedona, Arizona, there have been categories on how the witnesses perceived their UFO experiences. 60% said positive, 10% said negative, and 30% said neutral. I thought that was pretty cool information that I wanted to share with you. But based on data collected by Cheryl Costa and Linda Miller, they revealed that Sedona, Arizona has a total of about 160 sightings between 2001 and 2020. I've come across a few other stats where it's about 300 sightings, but those are the, those are the sightings that have been reported. Now, about, let's just say about 10% like that number is about 10% of what people are actually seeing. Because, I mean, for, for the majority of people that have a UFO sighting, who are they going to call? Who are they going to contact to collect that data, right? If they're not knowledgeable in, in this field, like even the basics, 
they're going to keep that information to themselves. So that 160 sightings or 300 sightings, that's only 10% of possibly what people are actually seeing in these locations. And that's globally um, in, in the sense of any number that we see, just keep in mind, multiply that by a lot. So I also looked up, is there a military base nearby? And there is one likely in Camp Verde, which is about 30 miles from Sedona, Arizona. And then there's another one in Glendale, about 110 miles. And there's another one about 200 miles in Sierra Vista. Something that, you know, again, it's worth mentioning. Use that information as you wish. Yeah. Who are you going to call? Definitely not Ghostbusters in this situation. <laughs> well, I have one more location for you. Take a guess on what you think the number one hotspot is going to be. Well, while you take a guess, we are at 166 likes can we get to 200 we have 200 people watching this smash the like button because it really does help the youtube algorithm to pick this show up and it lets me know that you're also enjoying the shows as well so hit the like button support the channel you guys are awesome i love all of you so take a guess where do you think the last hot spot we're gonna cover i'll give you a hint it is in the united states let's see let's see just gonna get it right well, I'm going to pull up this image and maybe it'll give you an answer because we are looking at the extraterrestrial highway in Nevada. This is a 98 mile stretch of State Route 375 located in rural Nevada. And this runs through the Nevada Test and Training Range, an area that has been associated with stories of strange sightings and rumored government cover-ups. The extraterrestrial highway gained national attention in the late 1980s when Bob Lazar claimed to have worked on alien technology at a secret facility near Area 51. That's how this place got really famous, because of Bob Lazar. And there have been numerous reports of strange sightings and unexplained phenomena along this highway. Witnesses have reported seeing UFOs, strange lights in the sky, and even alien creatures. Crazy. Some have claimed to have had close encounters with extraterrestrial beings, while others have reported seeing military aircraft engaging in secretive operations. It was officially designated as the extraterrestrial highway back in 1996 in honor of the area's reputation as a hotspot for UFO sightings. I think that is so awesome. I love that. So it got famous in the late in the 80s and then 1996 rolls around and the everyone that's a part of the Nevada state government, right? They look at each other and they say do you think we should give that highway a special name? Do you think with all the sightings that are happening, do you think we should call it the extraterrestrial highway in honor of, 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 of this place? That is a great idea. Let's do it. And then those tax dollars made this sign right here, the extraterrestrial highway. Love that. One of the most notable landmarks in the area is the small town of Rachel, which is located along the highway and has become a hub for UFO enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists as well. Originally called Sandy because it it was just filled with sand, as we can see in this image right here. But Rachel is the youngest town in Nevada and is considered the UFO capital of the world. Now, that's a pretty big statement. I mean, after looking at Thailand and Australia to call it the UFO capital of the world is intense. But then, you know, you have the conversation of Area 51, which is the most famous location on planet Earth. You're like, OK, OK, that, that kind of makes sense. But now the name is so it was once Sandy. Now it's Rachel after Rachel Jones, the first child born in the community found by D.C. Day back in 1978 pull up another image 
And then, of course, in this, I mean, this town is tiny, guys. This town is so small. But there is this very cool restaurant, bar, and motel called Little Ailey Inn. <laughs> I like that play on words. And this is a very famous sign that you can find throughout the internet. People are posing near it, around it, with it, just like with this one as well. If you look at the sign today, it is filled with stickers. Stickers are everywhere. And then there's good old Rachel Nevada. And I love that the little sign has a UFO. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Population. Human? Yes. Alien? Question mark. I like this sense of humor. It's very fun. But look at the scenery here. You have this one long stretch of road. You got some yellow looking grass, which isn't that great. But look at that landscape right there. Look at those beautiful little hills and mountains. It's a very, very pretty image. But of course, our eyes go right here. And I don't blame you. But just looking at that beautiful stretch of road with one car. No, one, two, three cars on this huge stretch of road. That's where I want to be. I, I, I love those empty roads. There's nobody there. No one trying to cut you off. No one honking at you for driving too slow or too fast. Those are my kind of roads right there. And in this case, very pretty. Here's another image of a location. This is one of the research centers. And you get this ginormous tin-looking alien. Does he have a nose? Tiny one right there. <laughs> very cute. So this... This little this little place right here, as I mentioned, is home to the Little Alien, a popular restaurant and motel that caters to visitors interested in the area's extraterrestrial history. But other notable attractions in the area include Area 51 Military Base, which is located about 35 miles to the south of the highway. Now, back in November of 1989, a Las Vegas resident, Bob Lazar, claimed on television this is big news, that he had worked with an alien spacecraft and that he was hired to reverse engineer the propulsion system on one of the craft. As soon as his claims went public, a rush of curious UFO seekers traveled to the area to look for UFOs for themselves. If you're not familiar with the Bob Lazar story, Jimmy and I did part one and then for part two, Richard Dolan also joined us in the conversation. You can find those right here on this channel because we do go into depth on that story. But the origins of this road, and I'm going to pull back that, that image, this one, going through Rachel. It dates back to the 19th century when it was used as a wagon road for mining and ranching purposes. And then in the 20th century, the road became a popular route for military convoy and later for atomic testing in the nearby Nevada test site. And as the sightings of UFOs and other strange phenomena along the highway, there have been numerous reports over the years. One of the most famous incidents occurred in 1997. Do you know where I'm going with this? Let me continue if you don't, because this is one a group of witnesses reported seeing seeing a series of strange lights in the sky near the town of Rachel, Nevada. And the incident became known as the Phoenix Lights, and it is still a subject of debate among UFO enthusiasts. But it all happened right here. One more thing that I did want to touch on that I actually knew nothing about that would be really fun to share. And that is the black mailbox. How many of you have heard of the black mailbox? Because there's the black mailbox incident. Because back in the late 90s, a man named Steve Meldon installed a black mailbox on the extraterrestrial highway to receive mail and packages and letters from his friends. However, the mailbox became a popular spot for UFO enthusiasts who believed it was a meeting point for extraterrestrial beings. And then in 1996, the mailbox was vandalized and later replaced with the white one. So then the white one came along and it had a reflective strip to make it easier to see at night. 
However, this mailbox once again was repeatedly vandalized and shot at by people who thought it was a government surveillance device. In 2019, the white mailbox was removed and a new black mailbox was installed by the rancher who owns the land where the mailbox stands. So it went from a black mailbox and it was hated, white mailbox, it was hated, and it went black back to a black one and now it just stays there. People just understood. They're like, okay, it's just a mailbox. There's nothing to it. Just let the poor rancher get his mail. And that's what it's there for now. And I, I found that story, it just, I found it kind of comical because it wasn't one that I've heard before. But one last thing that I would like to touch on is that in 1994, the late Larry King brought a crew of 50 to Rachel, the town, right, that we're seeing right here, for a live two-hour special on TNT. And they built an open-air site set in the desert area where they began interviewing UFO researchers and enthusiasts, one of them being Stanton Friedman. He was on the panel. And you can find that that whole show on YouTube for free if you want to watch it. I think it's very, very cool. And there has been a, a few other sightings there as well. But I think that many of you are probably very knowledgeable on the extraterrestrial highway. And it's a place that I would love to visit. It's on, it's on my list of places to go when I get the RV and travel the United States, hitting all the UFO and paranormal hotspots and taking you on the journey with me. Out of all the locations that we covered today, which one was your favorite? And it's okay if you're biased, if you live in that country or in that area, I'd love to hear it. And please let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments as well. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server with 1,600 other like-minded members where you can share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more tomorrow. Great news. Tomorrow is the interview I did with the security guard from Skinwalker Ranch, Kayla Bench. It's going to premiere tomorrow. Make sure to hit the notification on the bell so that you do not miss it. And then on Thursday on Mysteries with the History is going to be new discoveries on on. Sorry, it's going to be Ancient Mysteries, New Discoveries, which is going to be super awesome. And just wait until you see what we have in store for you. And then on Friday is Weekly Strange News, the show where this channel gives back to you with the gift card drawing every single week. I love doing these drawings with you guys. It's so much fun. So if you like the sound of these shows, we do three every single week. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notification bell so that you do not miss any of them. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. And if you enjoy all of the content that you're seeing right here, do you consider being a Patreon supporter? All of the funding goes straight to the channel and to the RV fund. Hit the like button before you head out. Leave a comment as well. We are so close to 30,000 subscribers. I am, this is so awesome. And it could not have been possible without you. So leave a comment below. I do read all of the comments. Let me know your favorite hotspot. That is it for today. I will see you guys tomorrow. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.